The supply chain was breaking down before the war in Ukraine. That was breaking down beginning in 2018 with Trump's trade wars. We don't have to debate the pros and cons of tariffs and trade wars. Uh, there are two sides to that, but that, there's no question that that disrupted the supply chain when Trump put tariffs on imported uh, you know, solar modules and uh, consumer durables and refrigerators and air conditioners and everything. Well, it was coming from everyone, but it was clearly aimed at China. China retaliated by saying, we're not going to buy any more U.S. soybeans. And they bought their soybeans from Brazil. Now that sounds like, oh, okay, you change your purchase order from the U.S. to Brazil, what's the big deal? It's a huge deal. And they move them on ships. You know, you got to redirect all that ship traffic, change all those shipping lanes, break a lot of long-term contracts. The U.S. has to scramble to say, well, we got to sell the soybeans to the Dutch because the, the Chinese aren't buying them anymore. The point being, the logistics, the trains, the, the train lanes, the cargo lanes, it all get scrambled. So that was going on before the pandemic. Then boom, here comes the pandemic and you're, the Chinese are, you know, they got the zero COVID policy. You might as well have a zero cold policy. You know, no one can get a cold. We're going to shut down the city of 26 million people, which is Shanghai. And next to Shanghai is a place called Ningbo, which is the biggest port in China. Most of the containers showing up at the port of Los Angeles are coming out of Ningbo. Well, th that's all affected. And so, th so the, the global supply chain is, is breaking down. It was already breaking down. Now it's a lot worse. Now, along comes the war in Ukraine. Now, I know there are different sides of the war. They're in a, a fight to the death. But taken economically, if you combine Russia and Ukraine, you're looking at 25% of all the wheat exports in the world. Now, obviously, that's a huge number. But the point is, there are countries where they get 100% of their wheat from one of those two places. Lebanon gets 100% of its wheat from uh, Ukraine. Lebanon is the best case anyway, and now there's, there's no food. There are countries in Africa where people are gonna be starving. That's gonna be not just an economic dislocation and an inflationary vector, it is that. But you're looking at humanitarian tragedies on a, 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 a colossal scale. Uh, you're looking at starvation. Let's not stop with wheat. For example, they are not allowing any advanced semiconductors to be exported to uh, Russia. Certainly can't come from the U.S., but the, U the United States went further. We said, we don't care who you are, if you're China, Taiwan, Japan, anyone else. If you're manufacturing advanced technology equipment and tools and using semiconductors that involve U.S. technology or U.S. tools, because you're operating under a license from the United States, you can't export to Russia either. Now, enforcement is another issue, but so far the Chinese have kind of towed that line. So we've cut off basically advanced equipment and semiconductors to Russia. Okay, that affects defense and aeronautics and a lot of other industries. Russia said, okay, two can play. How do you make semiconductors? Well, you know, they're, they're wafers and uh, they're different layers. You need the, the chemicals and the strategic metals to make those layers. But more to the point, you, you etch the circuits on the semiconductor with lasers. How do you power the lasers? Well, there's a certain kind of compressed neon gas that's used to power the lasers to etch the semiconductors. 70% of that processed gas comes from a single plant in Odessa in Ukraine. So now it's like, this isn't oh, no semiconductors for Russia. This is no semiconductors for the world because the world can't get the neon gas they need to run the lasers to etch the semiconductors. So these supply chains are breaking down. And, and you're like, why isn't it worse right now? The answer is manufacturers and intermediate participants in the global supply chain have what they call safety stock. It's, it's a little extra inventory, maybe more than you want, but just in case there's a minor disruption. Well, this isn't a minor disruption. This is a major disruption. You can get by for 30 days using up your safety stock, but then you got to go reorder. And that's when you find out that either the price has tripled or it's just not available at any price. Or even if you can put the order in, the shipping lanes and the transit lanes are broken down and you're not going to see it until next year. And, and I, I could go on and on. Probably don't need to go into every example, but I can assure it's a really long list. You know, aluminum, platinum, palladium. You know, everyone loves EVs, electric vehicles, you know, the Teslas or whatever. Uh, Teslas run, run on batteries. Le leave aside the fact that you have to charge the batteries with coal-fired plants. 58% of China's energy comes from coal. Not oil, not natural gas, not uranium, coal. And they're the leading producer of electronic vehicles, so they're basically emitting huge amounts of CO2 to charge up your Tesla. It's not like the electricity comes out of, uh, out of the air. You can't build those cars without batteries. Well, what's in a battery? Nickel. Where's nickel come from? 
comes from Russia. Where's the lithium come from? It comes from mines, many of which are in Russia. How does Boeing make aircrafts? Well, you need a lot of aluminum. Where's it come from? Russia, titanium, Russia. I mean, there's a group called the Five Eyes. You, you may have heard of them, but Five Eyes are five Anglo-Saxon community, if you want to think of it that way, who share intelligence. They share intelligence that they would not share with anyone else, even allies. And the Five Eyes are UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. And they share intelligence among themselves. Well, they've now kind of expanded their uh, mandate, if you will. And the Five Eyes recently came out with a report. I just call it the Five Eyes Report. It's got a longer official title. They looked at what we're talking about. They looked at global supply chains from a strategic dependence point of view. And what they did, they identified over 5,000 categories of, of goods. And they looked at all the countries in the world. And they asked themselves two questions. Number one, how much of your supply of that good do you import? And then number two, is more than 50% of that supply from a single source? And if the answer to both questions was, well, the first question is, is what it is. But if that's a high number and more than half comes from a single source, you would consider strategically dependent on that source. And they ran it and the results were shocking. I've read the report. 100% of the aspirin in New Zealand comes from China. So if you're in a trade war with China, don't... Uh, you know, don't look for relief in a hangover because you're not going to get any aspirin. But on a serious note, the dependencies are huge. UK was actually a little better, a little less dependent than, than some of the others. But Canada, the US, you know, Boeing gets 35% of the aluminum that they use in aircraft manufacturing from Russia. Well, you cut that off. Good luck getting new planes, you know, et cetera. Pharmaceuticals, uh, strategic metals, uh, oil and natural gas, obviously wheat. Oh, well, the biggest one, maybe fertilizer. Like, oh, no wheat from Ukraine. That's a problem. Well, how about no wheat from the United States? Because you can't get the fertilizer. We're living in a world of very short attention spans, kind of insect level attention spans. But the world goes on with leads and lags. And a lot of the things I'm talking about, they don't happen overnight. They are happening but the impact might show up in three months or six months or a year, et cetera. But it's very easy to see the inflationary uh, potential of all this. So you got two things going on at once, shortages and supply chain disruption. So you might not be able to get goods. I don't know, I've been to the UK lately. I wish I had, <laughs> I'm going there, but it's hard to travel these days. But at least in the United States, you go to the supermarkets and the shelves are partly bare. Now, it's not like every shelf is bare like, you know, East Germany in 1956, but there's like, you know, hey, there's no peanut butter this week. There's no chips or the soda's gone, et cetera. And, and then, you know, for example, I like a particular brand of salsa, like hot salsa, and I'll go and there's none there. There's none on the shelf. I'll go again and there's none on the shelf. So the third visit, they got a case in. Okay, I'll buy half the case because I'm not, I'm not going to take it. I'm not usually buy two jars, but I might buy six jars or eight jars because I don't know when I'm going to see it again. Of course, I'm hoarding, right? And I'm contributing to the supply chain shortage because the next person's not going to get any. But that's my response function to the fact that I got shut out the last two times. Well, everyone's doing the same thing. That's just human nature. So it's just getting worse. But uh, shortages, yes. Some of these will be critical in terms of manufacturing, and some of them will be uh, tragic in terms of starvation and higher prices across the board.